This program's called Ways to Change the World. I mean, you want to blow up the whole system now, don't you? Well, I think that the system has already been blown up for me. Uh, he, has, he has completely destroyed the Republican Party. In my film, John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House, Republican, uh, said there is no Republican Party anymore. It's called the Trump Party. And there is really no Democratic Party anymore because the Democrats are completely impotent and incapable of getting somebody into the White House. You have to understand, the Democrats have won the popular vote, what we call the popular vote, meaning the most people. If you just count them up, they just, won more. Yes. But not the Electoral College, which is this very complicated way that America chooses a president. Yes. Basically, it gives more votes to the former slave states. And that was done 200 years ago to convince the slave states to be part of the new country. So uh, basically, the, well, the Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections, which means since Daddy Bush was president, was elected in 88, the Republicans have won only once, once in 30 years since 88, and that was in 04 with Junior Bush, uh, and he only won by one state with 65,000 votes. So the American people have made it very clear for 30 years they do not want the Republicans running the country. They want the Democrats. And yet, considering that they won that many times and that every opinion poll shows that the majority of Americans agree with the Democratic Party platform more than they agree with the Republican Party platform, the Democrats, as we, as we sit here today doing this podcast, hold zero power. They don't have the White House. They don't have the House. They don't have the Senate. They don't have the Supreme Court anymore. Uh, in 50 of our state capitals, the Democrats control eight of them. That's it. So, so this is absolutely disgusting that the, the so-called Democratic Party can't you know, fight their way out of a paper sack and, 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 and hold some kind of power. So my point is, it's already blown up. Both parties have, have imploded and we're in a whole new game right now. And of course, when you have a void like that, that's a dangerous moment too for an autocrat that wants to perhaps grab more power. Right, but the Constitution is going to save America, isn't it, from an autocrat? The Constitution is a piece of paper. First of all, you're, at, you're a Brit. You're asking, you don't even have a Constitution. <laughs> you haven't written anything down. You know, we you we have, have habits. Yes, you have <laughs> habits, you have common law, uh, you, you have feelings. Um, you did have the, the, the Magna Carta. Okay, I'll give you that, all right? They wrote it down once in 12, whatever that was. And, uh, and <laughs> you guys haven't written anything down since. That is what we call a constitution. But there is this belief that America has these strong rules that will prevent a fascist leader or an autocrat ever taking over. You can only ever be president for eight years. You know, I mean, it can't happen. It can happen. Germany was a strong democracy. Germany had a constitution. Uh, after World War I, they, they were doing their best to form a, a, what is essentially was a liberal democracy. And, and in 1932, a right-wing party... Uh, got a, a minority, but the most votes of any of the parties. So they got, I think the Nazis got 32% of parliament. And uh, the communists got 19%. And then there's all these other liberal left parties that got, you know, most of the rest of the, of the votes. Um, it happened there. And it, it, we don't need to go back even 100 years to see how it can happen. And it can happen in an intelligent society, a cultured society. And, and I, in my movie, I show this front page editorial from the Jewish Weekly uh, in Frankfurt, the month after Hitler's inaugurated, and the editorial is saying, okay, everybody, calm down. Yes, Hitler's crazy, but nothing's gonna happen to us. We're a constitutional democracy. There's a constitution that protects us. That we are going to be fine. They're not gonna put us in ghettos. Uh, they're not gonna exterminate us. Uh, just quit talking that talk. You're talking crazy. Well, they weren't people who thought that was going to happen weren't talking crazy, but they were made to seem like they were crazy because, you know, but they would, you know, I, the research I did on this is amazing. Like people would say, people writing letters to each other, you know, of, of German Jews saying, you know, don't, don't be saying this stuff about how it's all going to come crashing down. You know, your uncle, he's, he's a conductor of the orchestra and your other, your cousin is the editor of the newspaper and there's a half a dozen judges who are Jewish here in Berlin. And look at all the war statues from World War I to Jewish Germans uh, who were war heroes. They had all convinced themselves that it was going to be okay, which is what you do. We, that's a human thing to do. If right now during this podcast, we heard a, a loud bang 
outside the window. The first thing that we think of is not that someone has fired a gun out there. We think that a tire has blown or maybe somebody, the garbage truck has dumped the dumpster too hard onto the sidewalk or whatever. Our brain will give us all these other reasons why there was just a bang that we heard. And we don't go to the place that we would in our caveman days where we would have gone to. In the caveman days, when they heard, the they brain fall. went, run away, <laughs> run away. And that is that is what we don't do anymore. When the red flags go up, we go, we try to rationalize it. And we try to, and we have, and we have our chat shows and we, we try to talk, you know, calmly with reason. And it really won't be that way, Mike. And, you know, you know, it, we, sh good and, and good people shall prevail. Yeah. Okay. That may be true. And it may not be true. But what kind of autocrat do you think Trump would be? I mean, you, you're not really saying he's Hitler, are you? I mean... No, no, no. No, of course not. Now, I might imply that Hitler was Trump. That's a different podcast. But uh, <laughs> it's... No. It, history never, that cliche of history repeats itself, it does not repeat itself. It's never exact in the way it repeats itself. But there are lessons to be learned and there's things to always be worried about and to be concerned about based on what's happened in the past. It's, it's, it's why when you think of Nazi Germany, I never understand why you have to put an adjective in front of Germany. I think it's because it helps us to remove ourselves from thinking that these were actually human beings and that they were citizens of a democracy. And it's better to think of them that were aliens that somehow dropped out of the sky and they were Nazis and they were evil and they were bad and they were like, you know, when actually, no, you know who they were? It was the German guy working on his car next door to you, you know, and, and it was the person bagging your groceries. And it was, you know, they were normal people. And I think that, that over time, We've, we've tried to blow up that whole era into something that it probably really wasn't. And that all humans are capable of evil. And, and in order to, in, I think we have to own that to understand how easy it can happen. Democracy is a piece of paper in our country. That's really all it is. And it's how we choose to follow that piece of paper. There is no self-correcting mechanism in democracy. When, when the car goes into a skid, you know, the modern car now has a braking mechanism to help pull the car out of the skid. There's nothing in democracy that is automatically going to pull you or I out of the skid. And someone like Trump, yes, very easily could take that car right off the cliff. So you, you make movies, don't you, to change the world, to change the way people think? Yes, well, I, make, I make movies, well, for a number of reasons. I make movies, uh, yes, I want people to think about things. I want them to maybe consider a different way of looking at something. But I also, I'm a filmmaker. So I know they've worked hard all week and I'd like them on a Friday or Saturday night to be able to go out for a couple of hours, sit in a movie theater and after two hours leave there and say to each other, wow, that was, that was really something. And the comedy punches are really important. Absolutely. Well, for me they are. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because, yes. Because you know, with documentaries, so many documentary filmmakers believe they have to bludgeon the audience over the head. Like somehow that, that won't get them to come, that's going to make them come around. That is that all that makes them do is want to go get a drink. Uh, to take care of the headache you've just given them. So no, you come to my films. Yes, I use satire and, and humor um, as a vehicle uh, through which to explain uh, you know, what I think is going on. But I mean, aren't, aren't you actually letting the American people off the hook a bit? I mean, you know, they elected Trump. I mean, maybe not the popular vote, but a huge number of people voted for Trump and they're getting what they wanted. Three million less than the other person. The other person won. The American people didn't want him. And in fact, not just the three million that Hillary won by, there were another close to seven million, either Greens or Libertarian Party, two other parties, got seven million, I think around seven million combined votes. So that's 10 million people that didn't want Trump. But millions of people heard him slagging off Mexicans, calling them criminals and rapists, talking about grabbing women by the pussy. Yeah. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. And they still wanted him. Yep. Millions of people believe that Adam and Eve rode on dinosaurs 6,000 years ago. So what? So are they the deplorables? <laughs> what they, they get the vote too. But are they the deplorables that Hillary talks about that you write off and say, forget about them? No, I think you what know? she was saying once is that what's deplorable is the racism and the misogyny. That was, that was deplorable. The, the part I didn't agree with Hillary, because the, the other half of her sentence was about the deplorables, 
is that they were um, um, irredeemable. They were beyond redemption. I don't believe anybody really is beyond redemption. Um, you know, maybe one or two people over at the BBC. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> I believe that most people, it's possible for them to be redeemed. I meant ITV, by the way. I, I take that back. <laughs> if you're listening now, the, they're crying over the BBC. Why did he say this about us? But do you think your films ever change anyone's minds or are you, are you preaching to the converted and trying to activate the, the quiet ones who aren't voting? Well, first of all, the choir always needs a song to sing. Yeah. So there's never anything wrong with giving the choir something. They're just sitting around anyways, you know, doing what all I don't know. But, but so having them, giving them a great song to sing is a, is a, is a valuable exercise. Uh, secondly, the... Um, uh, in trying to convince somebody to change their mind these days, that's a difficult um, process. Because imagine this, if somebody you know is still supportive of Trump after seeing him behave in these first two years and they still love him, they might be kind of, you, they might be gone. You know, it's, it's, you're not gonna be able to convince them. They believe the way they believe. Aren't they more likely to still support him now? I mean, he's delivered on the things he said he would. You know, he's, uh, he's delivering jobs, the American economy's doing well, he's taking protectionist measures to protect manufacturing well, industries. The economy's doing well, you mean it's doing well, Wall Street's doing great, and, and the rich are doing great. Yeah, but he's but, also protecting factories as well, isn't he? I'm no, he's right? not. He says he does that, and then you go there, and you've done this. I've seen Channel 4 and I've seen other countries go to that town in Ohio and to these places where he said that they've, they've saved these jobs and they haven't saved half the jobs and everybody's working for a lower wage. It's, 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 look, he's very good at the P.T. Barnum element of this, of, of selling you know, the bill of goods that he's selling you. But the, the truth is, is what people are... What I'm worried about is that, that the people who voted for him who now realize that it's a bit of a sham, especially when it comes to their personal lives, that they just give up now and they just stay home. You know, it's like, okay, I've had it with all of them now. I'm not, I'm not especially I'm worried about, there was 8 million people who voted for Barack Obama that then voted for Trump. See, now I think those, I think those 8 million, we can hold our hand out to them and say, come on, come on back. It's, it's okay. We understand why you voted for him. This latest movie of yours, you explore this new movement mainly of women who are entering politics for the first time and deciding to stand. I mean, how, how significant do you think this is? It's huge, huge. Um, the possibility of that women are going to take him down is, is, um, is, it's likely. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's all going to depend on who shows up. Um, but I think there are so many women on the ballots across the country um, in November um, and and he has done he's been very successful I think in in um, upsetting a lot of women they understand now what the Brett Kavanaugh appointment was about to the Supreme Court and it was about men um, having control over their reproductive organs and you know that's where politics kind of goes out the window and, and then it becomes personal and it's like say what you know they, even if they voted for him they're like what do you what do you mean by that um, and <laughs> what he means is he's going to make abortion illegal. That's what they're going to do. And, um, and Brett Kavanaugh is going to be leading the way. That is what exactly this was about. But do, do you think they can be more articulate about where they're coming from in terms of from the left? I mean, I interviewed Rashida Tlaib, and she wouldn't say to me that she was a socialist. You know, she, she was scared of saying that. Mm. Do you think they have the confidence to say this is what we believe in? Well, she says that, that she's a, a democratic socialist. I've heard her say it. She, she, uh, she, it's on her, it's on her literature. So, um, but when you talked to her, she was afraid to say it. She was kind of yeah. I mean, I, had she won the primary then? Yeah, she just yeah. won the primary and she was going to go to Congress. And yeah, it was like she didn't want to frighten the horses. Well, she's a Muslim woman. She's a Palestinian American. She's. <laughs> She's already, and she's a woman, so she's already pretty scary. I can, I can imagine, what is that like to have to go through that? I, I really, as a, as a white guy, you know, I've never had to go through that. So I, I wouldn't make any judgment about what she's afraid of. I, I imagine she has legitimate fears at this point, 
And, uh, but I have a strong belief that she's going to do what's right for the people. But do you think, I mean, you think America is sort of fundamentally liberal? Yes, um, I do. You know, do you think America is ready to vote for a movement that says, you know, we are of the left, we are liberal, we are democratic socialists? You know, because these have been dirty words in American politics for a long time. Right. So people like myself and others, Bernie Sanders, were making them less dirty. And, and the more people say it, the more it's, it's okay. I think that there's a misperception about the United States, especially in other countries. Um, and, and so in this film, I point out that 78% of us Americans do not own a gun. 78% do not own a gun. I don't, did you think that that was, you know? No, I was surprised by that actually. Yeah, yeah. 78. Uh, and I, in the film, I tell people 57% of Texas, Texas is not white. It's a non-white state. It's one of our three non-white states. If I were to say to you, name three non-white states in the United States, well, you go, well, Hawaii, um, probably New Mexico, because it's got Mexico in the title. It's a kind of a hint. You know, what's the third one? You'd never say Texas, but that's the truth. The truth is it's 57% non-white. Uh, the, the past mayor of Houston was a lesbian. Uh, th th this, is, this is the new America that I think the rest of the world doesn't really understand and is rightfully confused when people like Donald Trump end up in the White House. But isn't that what drives Trump supporters, a basic fear of, um, of being outnumbered? Yes, they, they know that. They know there's more of us than there are of them. And they know that's why they have to rig the elections with what, what we call voter suppression laws uh, to make it harder for the poor and people of color to vote. Uh, I don't know if you followed this recently, how in Georgia, there's a section of Georgia where they've been closing down polling places in black communities to make it harder for black people to get to the polls. That They've been doing this now for some time and they do it because they know they're gonna lose otherwise. I always say to Republicans, I say, how does that feel? How does that make you feel to know you won by cheating? I wouldn't feel good. I wouldn't feel good if I had known that the only way that I could get into office is to somehow fix the vote so that I'm in there. You're gonna sit in the office knowing that the majority of the people in your district don't support you. How must that feel? I don't, I don't get it. What was this sort of poor, white, slightly fearful America the one you were born into? I mean, you were born in Flint, um, the, the city you explore in this movie is the sort of one of the poorest places in America. Right. Were you born into this kind of fear of the future? No, not, no. When I was no, when I was born, it was like it didn't matter that your dad worked in a factory. In fact, it was a good thing. If your dad worked in a factory, it meant you had full health care, full hundred percent free health care, free dental care. Um, uh, if you needed a lawyer, the lawyer was the union provided you a lawyer for for free. I mean that that there was a middle class life that was guaranteed to you. It was it was it 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 the future looked good when I was a child. Um, and so that somebody like me, I have a high school education, could do what I've ended up doing with that high school education. Um, you know, that, that so-called American dream is gone. Um, as a matter of fact, actually now what it is, instead of being an American reality, which is what it was when I was a child, it is now an American dream. It is just a dream. And, and um, you know, but look, I'm Trump's demographic, right? I'm, a, I'm an angry white guy <laughs> over the age of 50 with a high school education. I check all the boxes for, you know, and I think, you know, it's interesting. Trump has come at, come at me, not as much as you would think he has, because I think he understands that there's some crossover in our two bases, in my base and in his. So he's very careful not to upset um, other working class, the working class people who support me. Um, because he wants those votes too. So this is so we're having so this is the great fight we're having. Now in this movie you've kind of admitted your previous encounters with Trump and his entourage. You know, that that Bannon was the distributor of one of your movies, um, that Jared Kushner was one of your backers, and that you've cozied up to some of the Trump people in the past too. I mean, is that something you feel bad about? No, I think if you're in the film or TV business in New York everybody has had encounters with Donald Trump. Everybody's been on shows with him or you've been at parties. You remember, I remember the first time I saw Donald Trump 
when I first moved to New York from Michigan, um, it was at a Planned Parenthood benefit. It was it was at a essentially a group that's pro-choice uh, abortion rights, and there's Donald Trump. Trump was always at Democratic Party events in New York City. Um, he always he always blew with whatever way the wind was blowing. Um, he has no actual beliefs, except his one belief: his belief in Donald J. Trump. That's the entirety of his belief system, which makes him very dangerous. People say to me, well, if we impeach Trump, we'd have Pence. That'd be worse. No, it wouldn't be worse. Pence believes in things. He believes if you're gay, he can convert you to being straight. That's a belief. And I, I don't fear him or the great debate with him because I'll win the debate. The, the American people are going to be on my side on that debate. He believes the earth is 6,000 years old. I'm going to win that debate too. I'm going to win all the debates with Pence because the American people support what I support, not what he supports. The people should not be afraid of Pence. But when you hear liberals talk, they always talk that, oh, I don't know, it might be worse if we have him. And, you know, it's like, I was talking to John Podesta. He's in my film. He was Hillary's campaign chair. He was a close advisor to Obama. And I said to him, what is wrong with the messaging on the left, on the liberals, the Democrats? They can't say a simple sentence to the American people like Trump does. You know, that's how he gets through. He talks in simple words. Why can't you say free college, free health care? You know, you get sick, you don't lose your home. That's our deal. If you get sick, no one's going to take your house or your car away. How come you can't say that? Well, because we have to study how much it's going to cost. No, you don't. Yeah, but we don't know if we can afford free college. It doesn't matter. We're Americans. We're constantly buying things we can't afford. That's what we do in our daily lives. Don't, just say it. Just say it. Say it. Free college. Well, he says, well, you got a point. You got a point. I said, well, I don't want to have a point. I want to win elections. Say the things that we believe in. We'll figure out later how we get the money. But if you believe the system is fundamentally bankrupt, you don't obviously think that the Democrats can do this, do you? I mean, don't no, we need a new movement? Yes, we need a new movement. We need more than two parties. Uh, we need a different kind of, you know, there's a whole bunch of things we need. Right now, what we need three weeks from now is we need to win. And what we do have are people on the Democratic side of the ballot that are very good candidates. We have a slew of progressives who are running, left-leaning Democrats, and we've got to get people out. I think my, my goal is in the next few weeks is to convince Americans, especially the ones who stayed home, don't stay home this time. I know why you've stayed home, because it's the same old rotten politicians. Not this election. We've got a whole group of people that are not professional politicians. And I showed some of them in my film. Here's the lady who's the, uh, she raises chickens. She's running for office. Here, you know, here's the woman who's a seamstress. She's running for office. Here's the Iraq vet who's come back. He's running for office. There's lots of good people to vote for in this election. You should not stay home. Can we just talk about the comparison between Trump and Brexit? Because there is a basic difference in that the majority of people voted for Hillary Clinton in the United States, but a majority voted for Brexit in the United Kingdom. Right. It's not the same, is it? It's not exactly the same. But, but the, the feeling was the same in the sense that you could see why there were so many people that were upset, either in the United States or here. And, and I was here and I was watching the news and the news seemed like a bit of a disconnect uh, those weeks leading up to Brexit. Uh, people didn't really think what was going to happen, well, what happened. People didn't think it would happen. And yet, as an outside person, it seemed like it was going to happen, just spending a week here. So, you know, uh, perhaps the, the media needs to get outside of its bubble. Definitely. And we had many of the same issues of people not feeling that their votes made any difference, right. depending on which party was in, was in power. Um, but we now have this thing where this was a once-in-a-lifetime choice, um, and they made the choice. So is it, is it Britain's duty, is it our democratic duty to see it through? Yes, for the same reason. If, if, if somebody has uh, climbed to the top of the tower and is going to throw themselves off, the police try to talk them down or try to grab them so they don't make that leap. So the leap isn't completely made yet, and so that's what I think well-meaning people are trying to do right now here in your country. You should try and change people's minds. It's to try to, sometimes you have to try to save people from themselves. Because you, you understand why they did it. They had every right to do it. They had a righteous anger. 
it was justified. Acknowledge that to them. And then, but then tell them, look, we look, look, let, let's just say you're from labor. You know, I'm, ta- I'm speaking now for the Labor Party. And I want to speak to the people who voted for Brexit. I understand why you did it. We broke faith with you. We stopped being the party of the people. We took this country to a war that the United States started. We've been snipping away at the social safety net, the very thing that, that, that has made Britain so different from other countries, that, that, that we try to make sure that nobody falls in between the cracks. And we've been taking that away bit by bit, and we haven't stood up for you, and we've heard your message loud and clear, and we apologize, and now we're going to fight for you. We're going to fight for you every step of the way. That's what needs to be said. And I think people will go, oh, okay, they heard us. Isn't there a Michael Moore film in Britain? Why haven't you done it? No, the question is, where's, where's, the, where's the 10 Michael Moores of Great Britain? You know, what, I mean, you should, you should have 10 or 100 of me uh, making the films that need to be, to be made here. I hope they're being made here. I, I, don't, I don't see them, but I hope somebody is listening to this and thinking, well, who is he to say that we need, you know, but it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, America needs 20 George Orwells. I mean, uh, you know, we, we need all the things that you've given us. Look what you've given us. I mean, everything from Dickens to, to you, or you took in others, you took in Marx and Engels and let them write their stuff here and didn't throw them in jail. At least I don't think you did. I hope you didn't. But at least they had a place where they could think. You know, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, 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 you know, even the composers that, that came from Austria and Germany came here to London where there, there was a little bit of more of cultural and artistic freedom. Um, th- th- this is your history. Your history is not to pull up the gates and say, you know, we're an island now. We really are an island. We're cutting ourselves off from everybody. There's, there's, there's you know, you, you, you can't leave Europe. There'd be no Europe without you. You saved Europe. You sacrificed hundreds of thousands of lives to save Europe. Not once, but twice. To think that, that this great country would want to then say at this point in the 21st century, nah, enough of that. We're done. You can't leave. I'm sorry. You can't go. Because we've seen that they can't do it without you. They need you as much as you need them. We all need each other. This is, the world is, we're not going to survive. Whether it's climate change, whether it's globalization, whether it's all the things that have been going on, we're not going to survive unless we realize we're all in the same boat together and we're going to sink or swim together. And I prefer not to sink. So I'll do my part. (laughs) People listening, do your part here. Um, But, you know, I'm telling you, you get off that channel train after you've left Europe, you're going to be standing in a long fucking line there in Paris. You're going to miss half the day in Paris standing in that fucking line I have to stand in. So stay out of the line, stay in Europe, and, and get your parties here to listen to you. I think they've heard you. You know, look at the Tories running around trying to figure out, you know, how to do Brexit. They don't know. They don't want to. If, 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 if Theresa May's guardian angel could just appear to her today and say, don't worry anymore. I've got it all fixed. <laughs> She'd be so happy, you know, because right now she feels like she's on the cross. So let's get her off the cross. You know, Tories, put your plan out there to the people what you're going to do to make this the Great Britain that you used to be. You know, you haven't dropped the word from the title. It's still great, right? It's still Great Britain. It's still a united kingdom, right? That's still your name. You know, act like it. Michael Moore, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.